the USA section of the International College of Dentists decided to record visually not only the history but several leaders in our profession. This presentation is a potpourri of the Chronicles of Outstanding Leaders in Dentistry series being produced by the Audiovisual History Committee. Dr. Nelson W. Roop, it's good to have you here for the, this part of the video series that we're doing with the International College of Dentists. Um, as you know, we've been collecting on videotape for the outstanding leaders in dentistry, and so it's real a pleasure to welcome you here uh, and get a chance to share some of your life uh, with me and, of course, all of the viewers. Um, I wonder if we could start maybe at the end and, and maybe work, work backwards. Um, you're recently retired now from the National Bureau of Standards. Right, yes, I retired September 1st of uh, last year from the American Dental Association at the National Bureau of Standards. And it has been a, a pleasure to be retired because they let me go back and work with us, one of my life joys. People ask me what my hobby is, and I said it's dentistry, and so that's what I, they still let me come back to uh, to the bureau. Uh, Dr. Ruth, tell me about the position that you held uh, right before you retired. The position before I retired was as uh, chief clinical scientist for the uh, work at the National Bureau of Standards, where we were testing materials in the aspect of the handling of those materials. How do we handle the material so that we get the physical properties that the manufacturer uh, wanted or designed in his uh, making of the products that uh, we as dentists and our assistants put together? In fact, we complete the manufacture of that material in mm. the patient's mouth. So we were working on the physical properties that make that material um, more durable than uh, it might be if it's mishandled. It, it, it seems as if that's an interesting ar arrangement. The National Bureau of Standards, of course, is a, is a national agency, and yet part of that is the American Dental Association. How does, how does all that fit together? Well, the, uh, after World War I, the Department of Defense at that time, uh, called the War Department, uh, from the Army Dental Corps received a request that uh, be a specification for the purchase of dental materials. There would be a federal specification. Oh. And the uh, first one they tackled was the alloy for dental amalgam, because the amalgam was the product that was used the most during the war, and they could not get a good alloy that would be predictably set and, and do the job that uh, they thought ought to be done. And in fact, when the dentists would get the material, the patients would be the guinea pig because the mm. dentist really didn't know what they had. So they asked for a specification, and when the specification was ultimately developed, the American Dental Association saw what a great boon that was to dentistry to have specifications, and uh, they were invited by the Bureau to come help, and uh, that was in 1928. The, uh, first uh, ADA employee went to the Bureau to help in the development of the uh, specifications. So, so the American Dental Association then is, is really helping to support the, the, the National Bureau of Standards in terms of the testing of dental materials? I would say yes to that. Uh, I think it's supporting and uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. They're working hmm. together. Uh, and in fact, it's evolved now where uh, NIH is uh, providing money to the ADA and to the National Bureau of Standards to help uh, support this work because of the things, uh, the different developments that have come out have uh, worked toward uh, bettering the uh, delivery of dental care and uh, uh, they feel that it is not just uh, something for the Department of Defense, it's not just something for the American mm. Dental Association, but the American public, the uh, ultimate user of the materials in their mouths, uh, is really benefiting from the uh, use of that material, of the uh, work that's being done. In, in one of the things that, that you wrote, you did mention um, about 
um, the fact that this, the, the survey methods were really valuable in terms of having an impact in on programs. And I wonder if you could just sort of expand on and, and give some examples of, of how, that, how that's happened. Well, um, it's difficult perhaps to, uh, to get the idea of just what you're referring to there, but uh, we feel that the survey methods have had an impact at so many different levels uh, in that so many times uh, people have just borrowed from the highly industrialized countries methods of training, methods of services, uh, for example, take my own country. Um, we were uh, looking after, at that time, Papua New Guinea, and in Australia, the average 12-year-old child had nine carious teeth. Mm -hmm. The average New Guinean child, at 12 years of age, in many parts of the country, had less than one carious mm -hmm. tooth. And even where the disease was higher, it was only around the level of three or maybe four carrier's teeth. So you had within that country already a range of situations, but totally different situations and different needs to the child in Australia. I see. And as you go around the world, you find many, many variations on that theme. So the impact was that very different approaches were required, even different methods of prevention. Based upon the disease patterns that you were finding in the country. That's right. And now I will, yes. now I will give you your quote. Good. Which says, <laughs> um, and this comes from um, uh, World Health Statistics Quarterly. Yes. Um, the power of the information base in guiding global oral health has been the single most important factor in its undoubted success. Right. Well, that was... <laughs> okay, well, I, I've given you, of course, yes, the, the background right. at, the, at the country level, but there is also, again, the global background. It was because yeah. of those methods and because we were able to aggregate them mm -hmm. in the Global Oral Data Bank that we were first able to say right back in 1973, look, disease is dropping mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the highly industrialized yep, countries. Yep. And you better look to the manpower production, you better look to the educational system uh, because this is happening and it looks like it's going to keep on happening. And we were also able to say that in a number of developing countries, the disease was going up mm -hmm. at the same time as it was coming down in the highly industrialized countries. So it was things like this that, that uh, made such an important impact. We also developed a new system for measuring uh, periodontal disease in partnership with the International Dental Federation. And that rather simple but very reliable method has also revolutionized our attitude to periodontal disease, where we've seen now the high levels of bleeding and calculus in the industrialized, in the mm. developing countries and much lower levels yeah. in the industrialized countries where there is good oral hygiene. But we don't see the same differences in destructive periodontal disease. Mm. And as you know, in the old days, we all knew and we were all taught mm. that if you didn't clean your teeth, you first of all got bleeding gums, then you got calculus, then you got mm. pocketing, then you got deep pocketing, and finally your teeth got loose and fell out. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that anymore. It's not that sort of nice oh, continuum yes. that uh, people had preached to us in those days. And it was because of the basic methods and this particular method that was developed for that situation that we've been able to see that some of our theories were not, yes. not uh, right uh, on uh, the uh, spot. Right. <laughs> Earlier, uh, there was an interview with uh, Dr. Roop, and he talked about dentistry 20 years from now, and he said, well, he didn't think it was going to change that much. What, what's your sense, Bill? Is, it, is dentistry 20 years from now going to continue through what, what appears to be some, some major transitions? It's, it's undergone such an enormous change in the past 20 years. I guess it's hard to foresee that we can change that much in the next 20, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath. My, my sense is that 20 years from now will have changed perhaps as much as we've changed in the past mm -hmm. 20. Changes have just been enormous. But think of the things yet we really haven't solved. Um, much of what we do is very imperfect and is pretty subjective, and we do because we've always done it that way. 
until a few years ago we didn't have an awful lot of respect for these soft tissues in the mouth we just sort of took care of the mm -hmm the teeth and we didn't worry about what surrounded them but my word in the last 10 to 15 years of course we've accomplished a great deal and we're much more concerned about it and I think do an infinitely better job. I remember my graduate training in terms of placing uh, margins of restorations with children particularly it was to get them up underneath the gingival tissue as far as we could because those teeth were going to continue mm. to erupt and expose those margins eventually mm. and the damage that we did back in those days just incredible but the uh, TMJ syndrome the uh, oral facial pain uh, occlusion I think we have so far to go before we come close to solving that problem the management of periodontal disease is for the few who I guess have mm. the motivation and the perhaps uh, resources to uh, handle it, but we've got a lot to do yet and I can't believe that uh, we aren't going to make as big changes over these next few years as we made before, but I don't know what they're going to be. Clearly implantology is going to be uh, much more in favor than it was mm. five or ten years ago. But science is being used now instead of simply anecdotal information about patients. And we've finally got something to build on. But I don't think there's still enough science in dentistry. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, our students get courses in biostatistics, but it seems to me they forget an awful lot about that once they get out into practice and are hooked into many slick-talking salesmen and buy into the wrong things. But dentistry has got to be more and more science. I would think, you know, over the next 10 years or so, perhaps many, maybe most dental offices will have computer terminals hooked into a mainframe someplace so that they can tap into it every morning and learn the latest on whatever there is out there. I think 20 years from now, it's going to be a lot different than it is. One hears that there's a need to bring dentistry closer into the mainstream of healthcare delivery. Uh, and um, I, I've heard talk about the concerns about the isolation of dentistry that it tends to sit apart from the Health Sciences Center. Um, what's your sense of that, Bill? Well, I think the isolation is one of the major one of the major faults with the way the system works today. But I'm not quite sure how to correct it. Bring it into bringing it into hospitals, bringing dental practices into hospitals was pretty hot stuff. What, 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and we saw departments develop in some hospitals, particularly I think on the East Coast. Fewer perhaps as you move from the East to the Midwest to the Far West. But this isolationism, this being alone and being out of the mainstream, oh I think it's it's devastating. Uh, I guess that's why we have dental meetings so dentists can talk to each mm -hmm. other. And it's one of the reasons perhaps that dental faculty like don't like to go to dental meetings because they're together all the time with somebody else and they're working the new territories. They know pretty well what's going on. And to go to a dental meeting and listen to things that are pretty much what they've already heard, it's not real exciting. And I think that's one of the things that I have faulted uh, myself and perhaps our faculty on. We have not been as good attenders as we should, and it's just a responsibility, it seems to me, being in dental education to participate with that practicing community. Because where I grew up, one without the other isn't going to cut it. And dental practice by itself is really not going to make it, dental education by itself is not really going to make it. The two have got to walk together and walk together, it seems to me, just almost every step of the way. But with what's happening to hospitals today, with some of the crises in, in medicine and among physicians and the growing discomfort, it seems to me, with uh, cost containment, I'm not sure this is a good time for dentistry to be moving in, in that direction. Mm. I'm not quite sure what the solution to that one is. We'll mm. ask you, will dentistry become a specialty of medicine someday? I don't um, know the answer to yeah, it. It, it. Should it be? I don't know the answer to it. I'm not sure. With what's happening in medicine today, maybe dentistry is a lot better being removed from it, at least for, for the time being. You know, medicine and, and nursing have basically split. And, well, I'll tell you, nurses out there are leaving the profession. There are many troubles getting enough applicants to nursing school these days. But physicians and nurses, 25 years ago, for whatever reasons, pretty much split apart. And I can see the same thing happening between dentistry and dental hygiene if we're not careful. There are a lot of political forces <clears throat> out there that would tend to keep pulling them apart. I think that'd be a tragedy.
Well, my interesting patient in, in North Africa was Absolutely. George Patton. Right. The, the general came in and, uh, and he was a great person. I mean, I enjoyed him very much. He wanted uh, to have his teeth examined, which I did, and he needed an inlay. Well, as an orthodontist, I had made very few inlays in quite a while, but I made him a mesial occlusal inlay on an upper right second molar. I can still see it. And uh, so then uh, he, when he was through, he said, um, Captain, let me have your name, organization, and serial number. And I said, well, uh, what are you going to do, prefer charges? And, and uh, he said, no, when someone does something nice for, for me, I like to do the same for them. Uh -huh. So then down from Supreme Headquarters came this commendation, which I cherish and, and have all right. the rest of my life. Did he really carry a pair of uh, pearl-handled pistols? He most or, certainly did. And what did, you, what did you get to do? Well, he, um, uh, he came in, and I was using a modified orange crate for a desk, and uh, uh, he took his... his uh, jacket off and his the, every general gets gets a belt you know with an insignia on the front of it he wore his all the time and he unhooked it and he had two holsters and two pearl handled guns and I said uh, these are the famous guns and he kind of chuckled and I said do you mind if I heft them and, and he said no of course not so I did and and uh, I said I've read about you and, and your Mexican border experience and and uh, he got a big kick out of that. Yeah. So he was, he was, he was a grand guy. I mean, he. Uh, and then I might elongate that story a little bit and say that uh, I then uh, a friend of mine permaplaked this um, this commendation, mm -hmm. and I had it on my wall of my private office, and and uh, a friend of mine from Boston happened to visit me and, and he saw it and he said, do you mind if I could have a copy of that? He said, I know Patton's son. And he said, I know that he would love to have a, a copy of that. So I said, no. So I made him one and I sent it to him. So two weeks later, I got a, a set of, a two volume set of the Patton papers, oh. autographed by Patton's son. Wonderful. Which I, I, it's, I cherish that very sure, much. That's very important. How, how do you feel dental schools will need to change then? I, I, I guess when I'm uh, we're sort of talking about you know bringing fewer dental students fewer dental students into schools, and yet at the same time we're we're seeing really dramatic changes in disease patterns and oh yes and populations who require care. Oh, we're changing curriculum modifications are going to uh, of course have to happen. We're seeing an aging population that is retaining their teeth. We, we have seen a 60% reduction in dental decay due to our very successful water fluoridation program in this country, even though 50% of the, the communities throughout the country are non-fluoridated, which means that you have vast areas in our country that still have decay patterns that were similar to those that we were seeing in the 50s before we realized that, that a, a small amount of fluoride in the water would, pre, would be, have a significant effect on prevention. We are seeing a, I think we're going to see a reduction in the number of special, specialty trained dentists. Mm. Students will be opting for general practice residencies where they can get a broad, broader and more in-depth clinical experience uh, which will give them a variety of, of uh, treatment modalities and experiences so that they can treat the, uh, the aging patient and the emerging understandings and, and uh, changes that occur in, the, in these patients that in the past we, we focused very little on. Uh, mm. Uh, in fact, mu much of it, we focused heavily on the child, we he focused heavily on the adult patient, but after, say, 40, uh, we just 
applied mm -hmm. information that we knew mm -hmm. to the adult population to an, an emerging whole new group of people. So, so we do have some challenges in that area. We've got some other things that are coming up, such as um, implants. We are advancing in implantology, such uh, as we understand more about uh, bone metabolism and how uh, the interfacing of artificial materials with with the uh, with the natural uh, t uh, bone substances. Uh, we have newer materials such as sealants that are also augmenting the uh, ability to prevent the uh, uh, progress of decay on teeth. We are concerned about root caries as, as the aging population uh, maintains teeth and as the, as the gingival line re recesses as, as a, a passive kind of eruption of teeth with the uh, attrition on mm -hmm. the surfaces of teeth. And we're seeing uh, a whole new addressment to prevention. In, in its broadest aspects, uh, not only what the dentist does to the patient to prevent, but the patient's ability to prevent disease by better oral hygiene, better care, uh, modification of eating patterns, and, um, and just a, a general uh, concern for wellness concepts that are developing in the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're talking now about uh, tomorrow's dentist, and it says, uh, but he must also assume a leadership role in shaping the laws and practices of his country and community to assure that comprehensive quality care is available to all and especially the needy. A doctor who is politically informed, civically active, community oriented, and socially conscious. Um, I wonder if you, I mean that's another yes. whole role for Dennis that right. we don't usually talk about. Right, and our curriculum is not geared to making a, a student politically aware and, and, and an activist, but we have seen a need to provide information and, and a stimulus to our graduates as they have gone out into the communities where they live throughout the country and throughout the world, and they've had to assume leadership roles, and, and really that's one thing that we have not uh, deans of dental schools have really not addressed. But we do know that our graduates have to assume those responsibilities yeah. because we see them across the country and throughout the world. And I think that who else can better champion the health and well-being of, of the, the population that you serve than those individuals that understand the disease trends and changes mm -hmm. and needs mm -hmm. and how services are delivered and the availability of care and the cost of care and the need, uh, the patient acceptability for certain kinds of of uh, delivery systems. When I started dentistry and uh, at Orange, I worked three nights a week and Saturday up till two o'clock and thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. And it didn't fuss me. I still had time to live and enjoy life. Right. And, and it worries me a little bit when I see the, the attitude of some of the young fellows that feel that the world owes them a living. And we see after the World War just what happens to countries for, for a number of years where everybody in the country feels the world owes them a living. Right. And um, I don't denigrate the youth of today at all. I think the youth today is, has great prospects. I delegate, uh, but I do denigrate some of the leadership that some of the members of our profession are giving. Uh, and, and of course, I'm very upset about government and some of the people who are in government who have got an idea that if you can dampen down the enthusiasm of the individual a little bit, don't make him learn quite so much bring somebody along who doesn't know all that so they don't want to be paid for what they don't know and the public will get a cheaper service and that's exactly what they will get. That's They'll right. get a cheaper service that's but it exactly won't be a right. service at all. Right. And, and I can see uh, not only in, in more than one country, I can see this happening uh, all around the English speaking world. I can't speak for the others because I can't communicate with them. But uh, I can see uh, where for the sake of uh, money that you get a, such a, a stupid suggestion by a politician as they have at the moment in, in New Zealand where they deregulate dentistry. And the yeah. fellow that sells me a paper could set himself up as a dentist 
as long as he didn't give anybody an injection and as long as he doesn't call himself a dentist. Oh. Now that's what they're trying to work to and these people are stupid enough to think that that's good for the, for the community. Mm. Now so it's not coming from the profession, it's being heaped on the profession by people, do-gooders, mm -hmm. who think that by reducing standards, not requiring people to know so much that, uh, that you will open up the gates for competition and competition always leads to something bigger, brighter and cheaper, not necessarily better. Mm. And um, I blame our own um, administrators in dentistry for uh, not seeing clearly enough what was happening and, and raising voices loud and clear and demonstrating what could happen if this thing is proceeded with. I know full well that the Australian Dental Association, the New Zealand Dental Association, the American Dental Association, the FDI have all bought into this argument in New Zealand, I know that. But when were they bought into it? When the ink was nearly dried yes. on the bill? Oh, too late. And um, mm. there should have been, not now, but there should have been before it got to this stage, a tremendous campaign from the people themselves demanding that they get a better service than what the, the government's mm -hmm. trying to give them. Uh, th then I'm very, very concerned about the attitude of some of our uh, young academics who feel that their um, spiritual home is with medicine rather than with dentistry. And you may or may not know it, but uh, mm -hmm. at the moment in Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth in Western Australia, there is every possibility that they will lose their faculties of dentistry and the faculties of dentistry will become departments of the faculty of medicine. Mm. Now that's what we had 50 years ago yeah, that's, uh, and if we <laughs> haven't learned enough in 50 years I wonder what's wrong with a young professional man that allow himself to have his profession so denigrated that he mm. becomes a handmaiden to a medico. Uh, you've only got to read the press and see what the public estimation is mm -hmm. of medicine and dentistry and it's far much, the dentistry stands far h higher mm -hmm. in the uh, applaud uh, and acceptance by the, uh, the public than does medicine at the moment because they're very unhappy about uh, noises of the medicos have been made for extra money and extra this and extra that and we haven't been condemned to quite the same degree as that. But to willingly uh, submit to losing a, a faculty, of, uh, of course you could argue this all day, and, and of course uh, what I've said is purely superficial, but it is only um, a, an attempt to make a short statement uh, mm -hmm. which has very deep oh, yes. depths mm -hmm. involved with the thing, and it's got to be argued out. But the thing that annoys me is that there are not enough people standing up and screaming about it. That's what we find here. And we've got a lot of dry finger dentists. Do you use that term here? We use it wet fingered and dry fingered, you bet. We've got a lot of dry finger <laughs> dentists who, uh, who've made me very annoyed over the years. As a prosthodontist, I have seen the time developing when there was a greater need for prosthodontic excellence than has ever needed to be in modern man. People are living longer. Mm -hmm. If you live right. longer, you've got to be able to chew longer to live longer. Right. Therefore, the problems of treating the geriatric patient are so great that you need a greater amount of expertise than you did when the patient didn't live quite so long and the tissues were more adaptable to the use of uh, uh, the presence of foreign bodies in the oral cavity. But then, in Melbourne, they even haven't filled the chair of prosthetic dentistry. They've just lumped it in with conservative dentistry. Mm. So they haven't got anybody who can really speak on behalf of prosthetic dentistry.